I love to shoot old guns, especially those from the Black Powder era. Let me show you how I make the ammo. This is an Alexander Henry double rifle made in the 1870s. It was made for Sir Seymour Blaine, an English baron who had seen considerable military service in India and was present during the siege and storming of Delhi in 1857. He also served at the Battle of Balaclava in 1854, where the charge of the Light Brigade occurred. This double rifle has several unique features. It has a Jones underlever, which is rotated to open and close the action. Two lugs on the lever engage matching recesses on the barrel lugs to lock the gun closed. This rifle has back action locks, which means the mainspring is behind the hammer rather than in front of it, like the locks on this English-made William Cashmore double. Another unique feature on this Alexander Henry rifle are the safeties, or bolting slides. The safety can only be engaged when the hammer is at half cock, and when engaged, it prevents the hammer from moving in either direction. The barrels are made of Damascus, which is common on shotguns, but not often encountered on rifles. This gun doesn't have a butt plate or recoil pad. Interestingly, recoil pads were not invented until 1874. However, the butt of this gun is checkered. Earlier, I cast the chambers to verify the caliber. 453 and a quarter, Black Powder Express. By pushing a tight-fitting cleaning patch down the bores, I can measure the rate of twist. The twist in this rifle is very slow, so I don't get a full revolution with the length of the barrel. Not a problem. I note the distance it takes for half a revolution and multiply it by two to get the twist, about one turn in 38 inches. Alexander Henry had his own style of rifling, commonly referred to as Henry rifling. It consists of seven flats with a raised ridge of metal formed in the corner of each pair of flats. The 453 and a quarter cartridge was originally loaded with about 110 grains of black powder and a bullet that ranged from 270 to 360 grains. Commercial ammunition isn't readily available so I'm going to make my own ammo. Brass is still available. It's the same as the 453 and a quarter Nitro Express. Commercial lead bullets are available also, but for this project, I'm going to cast my own. This mold will cast a 300 grain, 458 diameter bullet, which will work great for the one in 38 twist, and I'm casting them from 20 to one lead alloy. Now I slide the mold in on the rails and raise the handle on the casting furnace to allow the molten lead to flow out and fill the mold. It takes a few seconds for the lead to harden and then I use a mallet to knock over the sprue plate which cuts off the excess lead even with the base. The next step is to lubricate the bullets. Lubricant on a bullet fired in a cartridge loaded with black powder must do two things. First, it reduces leading, and second, it keeps the powder residue, or fouling, soft to aid in the chambering of additional rounds and to improve accuracy. A soft, beeswax-based lubricant, like this one from SPG, is a good choice for black powder cartridge rifles. A convenient way to lubricate these bullets is to use a technique known as pan lubing, which will fill these grooves commonly known as grease grooves. The lubricant is melted in a double boiler. The water is heated and melts the lube without any danger of scorching it. Scorched or overheated lube will not work properly, so never melt it directly over a burner. Once the lube is melted, the bullets are placed base down in the pan with some space between each. When the lube cools, the bullets are stuck in the solid lubricant. Not a problem. I use a pair of pliers to gently pick them out. Now I need to prep the cases. The first step is to bell the case mouse. 
The expander plug puts a tiny flare into the case and allows the bullet to start easily without damage to the bullet or the case. Next, I prime the cases using large rifle magnum primers. I'm using the priming arm on the press as the correct shell holder is too large in diameter for my hand priming tool. I make sure each primer is fully seated. With the cases primed, they're ready for powder. The original cases were loaded with black powder and I'm going to do the same. I like to use a drop tube when loading black powder as it increases the density of the powder in the case. For these cases, I'm using 120 grains of 2FG, which fills the case, leaving just enough room for the wad and the bullet. As you can see, using a drop tube settles the powder further down into the case as compared to just pouring it in. On top of the powder, I place a thin fiber wad to protect the base of the bullet from hot gases and keep the lubricant from contaminating the powder. The bullet is next. It should be seated right to this point, which is the crimp groove. Since this is a double rifle, I crimp each case mount to hold the bullet securely. This should be plenty of ammo, but I need to make one repair to this rifle before heading to the range. The rear sight originally had a small ivory insert dovetailed in place. These pieces of ivory were salvaged from old piano keys. The thin ivory will be perfect for installing into this rear sight. Ivory was used on piano keys from about 1700 to 1950. I begin by removing the rear sight using a brass punch to drift it out left to right. The recess for the inlay is a triangle about 40 thousands deep which closely matches the thickness of the ivory. A piece of masking tape on the back of the piano key protects and strengthens the ivory as I work with it. And Dicom allows me to see my measurements. I simply transfer those measurements to the piano key. Using a fine tooth saw, I cut out the new ivory inlay. The edges are cleaned up and beveled with a needle file. Once I'm satisfied with the fit, I super glue in the ivory and trim it to length. Then I drift the sight back in, going from right to left. At the range, the ivory inlay provides a great sight picture. With the safeties off, the hammers are pulled back. Shooting old guns is a lot of fun, especially when you reload for them.